Hello, everyone. Welcome to Trades Talk. I am your host, Pop. And yes, even though I had a special edition of Trades Talk on Sunday, I thought I'd still do my regular broadcast on Tuesdays, keeping up with the uh, with the tradition of always being on Tuesdays. And I'd like to welcome Angry Canadian. Good to see you, buddy. On YouTube and anybody who is on Rumble or Kick, I welcome you as well. For those of you that don't know, I am an actual industrial mechanic. I've been one for over 25 years. And I've seen and done quite a bit of things out there as far as the skilled trades go. And I just want to spread the word to everyone. That it's a, it, it would be a, uh, benefit them greatly for people if they decided to go into the skilled trades. As it is uh, something that can never be taken away from you once you learn it. And you can actually earn a very good living at it. And, you know, that's, uh, that's what we all want. We all want a comfortable living. And as I so often do, I'm going to start off with some news out in industry. That is courtesy of the uh, Plant newspaper or news magazine, as it were, as it were. So I just look through here, and we look through the news, and we see who's making or building new things, and whether or not that is good for industry whether or not uh, businesses are booming or whether they are shutting down. And you can always sort of tell how the economy goes by how what you read about the businesses that are going on. Uh, first one says, Stellantis, LG begin hiring staff for a future Windsor electric vehicle plant. Breakthrough in BC port dispute as new tentative deal is reached. China factory activity shrinks in July, adding to pressure to reverse economic slump. Flying taxis are coming, eventually, to an exclusive few. Oh, great. I thought people had a hard enough time driving on the roads, never mind flying in the air. Uh, U.S. economy unexpectedly accelerated to a 2.4% growth rate in April-June quarter, despite Fed hikes. Acon swings up to profit as backlog builds, even as legacy projects drag down earnings. Congress urged to revive long-stalled debate about regulating self-driving vehicles. Um, I, I've, I've got my doubts on self-driving vehicles. I don't think it, it's a very good idea. I think people should be aware of what they're doing and behind the wheel and that feeling of driving your own car why are you going to let a computer do it for you uh how do you know it's got your best interests in mind how do you know it's not going to turn avoid you know hitting some something but put you and kill you instead so i've got that's why i have reservations and hello to whoopa troopa nice to see you I was trying to tune into your stream there, but uh, I couldn't see it. A uh, new electric vehicle charging network being built by major automakers could lure more buyers into EVs. What's the meaning of this? Is 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 no sedition, no treasonous uh, goings on, Jig D. You need not investigate. Is all right. Oh, connecting issues. Took the stream down. Lousy internet. I know. I sometimes I have trouble too. Uh, a rolling recession or a rich session might spare the U.S. economy from a full-scale downturn. European Central Bank hikes interest rates for ninth time to combat inflation. 
Certificates and wallet cards launched by Skilled Trades Ontario. Okay, let's have a look. This sounds interesting to me. Let's see what they're going on about here. I'm not in Ontario, but it's still... It talks about the Skilled Trades. Let's see. Skilled Trades Ontario will begin issuing over 17,500 certificates of qualification and over 200,000 wallet cards to apprentices and certified Skilled Trades workers across the province this summer. This is an exciting milestone for thousands of skilled trades professionals, said Melissa Young, CEO and Registrar, Skilled Trades Ontario. Not only do certificates of qualification and wallet cards serve to validate credentials, they are a testament to the hard work, resilience, and unwavering dedication behind every certified skilled trades professional. Look forward to seeing them proudly displayed on work sites and in business across the province. I mean, is this something new for them? I, I, have, a, I have a wallet card that says I'm a journeyman. I keep it in my wallet. Uh, I, I don't get it. Like, this is some big fancy new thing for these guys? Uh, over the coming months, skilled trades professionals in compulsory and non-compulsory trades who receive certification after January 1st, 2022 will begin receiving their certificates of qualification in the mail. Certificates of qualification issued prior to January 1st will continue to be valid and recognized by Skilled Trades Ontario. It's an honor to be one of the first recipients of the Skilled Trades Ontario Certificate of Qualification, said Matthew Colbert. General Machinist at Lin uh, Linamar Corporation. After years of hard work and perseverance, I'm proud to be able to hang this on my wall. Okay, well, I, I, I also got one I can hang on my wall. I don't get why these guys are making a big deal about it. Do not spare us. The people must suffer. You look forward to the paycheck, not membership card. <laughs> hey, that one guy. How you doing? Nice to see you. Stopping in. Dues need to go up $50 a year to supply wallet cards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what does it say here? Uh, the flow of skilled people into our business is critical given the link to innovation and efficiency that are so essential to our global competitiveness, said Linda Hassenfratz, Executive Chairman and CEO of Linamar Corporation. This is why we are heavily invested in developing a generation of young people in skilled trades. I'm thrilled to see our skilled tradespeople getting the recognition they so richly deserve for the critical work they do and essential role they play in our business. A certificate of qualification is an official document that proves that a person is qualified to work in a particular skilled trade in Ontario. To obtain a certificate of qualification, individuals must require are required to have their pass their certification exam and have met all requirements to practice their trade in Ontario. Since the launching last year, Skilled Trades Ontario has provided online verification of the status and license details of compulsory apprentices and journey persons on its online public register. Well, we do that here too. All you have to do is uh, give your employer your uh, number, your journeyman number, and they can type it in and it'll pop up. And it'll give your name and what your skilled trade is. I mean, it's, it's uh, these, guys, these guys must be behind. Yeah, like, really. Yeah, I don't get it. It's we've we've been doing this in Alberta for a long time now. I guess these guys are just catching up. Um, let's see. What do we got here? Inflation has fallen, but the Bank of Canada hasn't backed off rate hikes. I think I went through that one last time. Hassan Pfeffer? Someone hit Bugs Bunny. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that one. Hassan Pfeffer. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, bump, bump, bump. new electric vehicle charging network being built by auto major automakers could lure more buyers into EVs. Honestly, are you guys, are you guys going to buy an EV? I'm not, I would not buy one until they're like 20,000 or $30,000. Like until you can get it down to that price, I'm not buying one. It's, it's not worth it. Clap like retarded still stupid me. <laughs> uh, old Jake D. Uh, Congress urged to revive long stalled debate about regulating self driving vehicles. Once again, self dive self driving vehicles. I don't think it's a good idea. E V enormous V eight, then yes. <laughs> 
2023 Honda Civic is 23K. That's for uh, a gas one, though, eh? Not, uh, not electric. Okay, so you guys want to see what this de long stalled debate about self driving vehicles? Da is gas. We fill with petrol. Can do 40 hectares on a tank of kerosene. Electric is more expensive. You have your 2000 Toyota Corolla. It will outlast me. Oil is optional. <laughs> oh, you got one of those ones, eh? That's the one where you stop at a gas station and check the gas and fill up the oil. Yeah, Corolla's a good car anyway. Runs on vodka in Motherland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, advocates for self-driving vehicle industry on Wednesday warned that years of regulatory inaction is putting American manufacturers at a competitive disadvantage and urge Congress to expand their ability to test and eventually sell autonomous cars and trucks. Who is the, who's the, the, who are the disadvantage? What's the competitive disadvantage? Who are they competing against? Is it self-driving versus regular driving? Is that your com competition? Right away, I just don't like the way they wrote this and how it sounds. Anyway. Uh, I'm sure it's rare for you that someone from the private sector comes before you to ask to plead for their business to be regulated, says John Bozella, president of the Alliance of Automotive Innovation, which represents several major auto manufacturers. We're at a crossroads, and without a comprehensive AV framework, companies are not going to succeed. While most Republicans and, and some Democrats on the House Energy and Commerce Committee seemed enthusiastic about speeding up the pace of AV research and testing in America, others warned about going too fast without addressing long-standing issues of safety and liability. Representative Frank Pallone of New Jersey, the committee's ranking Democrat, warned that Congress cannot simply dust off a six-year-old legislation and ignore the substantial issues that have emerged in recent years. Troubling safety incidents are mounting. Liability loopholes are emerging. I'm just imagining that's how he that's how he said it because he's from Jersey. Uh, the legislation in question is a 2017 bill on AV regulations that passed the House but stalled in the Senate. Currently, AV manufacturers can deploy a maximum of 2,500 self-driving vehicles for testing, provided they have permission from the National Highway Traffic Safety Safety Administration. AV advocates have complained that the limits represent a bottleneck that is holding back the growth of the industry at a crucial time. Currently, the NHTSA has spent more than a year considering a petition from General Motors to deploy 2,500 vehicles from its cruise AV unit for street testing and a ride-hailing service. Among the new proposals currently before the committee is one that would provide exemptions for manufacturers to deploy thousands of autonomous vehicles without meeting existing auto safety standards. Yeah, because that sounds like a good idea. Uh, one of the main sticking points surrounds liability in case of an accident caused by a malfunctioning AV. Industry advocates argued Wednesday that accidents involving self-driving vehicles are exaggerated and that the machines are already far more reliable than human beings. Gary Shapiro, head of the Consumer Technology Association, told the committee that self-driving vehicles are never distracted, never tired, and they don't get drunk. <laughs> they don't fall asleep. <laughs> okay, yeah, but when your electronics fail, they fail hard. You know? I've, I've, uh, you can get yourself a vehicle, you can get it going and running, but if you have it so that it's all self driving and it won't move because there's an interlock that's being held out and there's nothing you can do about it, you're just abandoning the thing. I mean, this is, this is, you know, in a, in a you know, in, it's all pie in the sky dreams, you know, in your, in your dream world, nothing would ever break down, but everything does and it's made to. So these guys are, uh, I don't know. I think they're wasting their time. I really do. At least it's not the yeehaw accent like me. <laughs> That's okay. We'll get to that one. When somebody, when there's a representative from your state, I'll make sure I bust out with the yeehaw there. Little buckaroo. Runaway oil tanker would go, could, that would go wrong. What could go wrong? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. You got a, a, a tanker a hauling uh, oil or gas or whatever. Yeah, and it just creams through people. Uh, just be it just needs a couple of those. Nobody ever shortcuts the safety or an interlock, do they? <laughs> if they can get their hands on it. Everything at Chernobyl is fine. <laughs> Is these fine comrade. Nothing to see here. Keep going. Uh but Representative Kelly Armstrong, R N D. I'm a, I'm assuming that means representative of North Dakota. Counter that human driving model at least provides clarity on who to blame and who should pay for the damage. When somebody gets injured, somebody gets sued, he said. When a minivan goes off the road in Florida and five people are killed, somebody is getting sued. Each one of these crashes is still going to be subject to a plaintiff's lawyer, an insurance company, and defense lawyer, and until we figure that out, this is just a science project. On General Motors' earnings conference call Tuesday, Cruise uh, CEO Kyle Voigt said his company's analysis of the first million miles of autonomous vehicle show use shows they had 54% fewer collisions than humans in similar environments and 92% fewer crashes where the autonomous vehicle was at fault. Okay, that's collisions, but how horrendous were they? Tell us that. Tell us, you know, you can have little fender benders and such, but uh, when you have a autonomous vehicle that doesn't apply the brakes at all and hits something at full speed, you know, that's probably a very horrendous crash. Very close. Republican Party of North Dakota. Oh, okay. I, I don't know these things, but uh, I appreciate you guys letting me know because it, uh, it makes it so I learn. Uh, what do we got here? Mm, but Auto safety advocates have cast doubt on industry claims about the safety of autonomous vehicles and the numbers they use to back up those claims. Missy Cummings, a former senior safety advisor in the National Highway Transfer Traffic Safety Administration, who is now an engineering and computer science professor at George Mason U University, said, that analysis of available data challenges those safety claims. Robot access from crews are eight times more likely to get into a crash than humans, she said, while autonomous vehicles from Waymo, a spin-off of Google, are four times more likely than humans to crash. I think we need to take their claims as being safer with a grain of salt. Of course they're going to keep saying that. They want to sell cars. So I'm not going to have a self-driving vehicle anytime soon. I think it's a bad idea. And I think uh, people need to enjoy driving. You know, when you're out there and you've got, you know, behind the wheel, you know, they got the top down, driving in the summertime, and yet, you, you know, you got your foot on the gas. You know, it's that's 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 awesome. That's that's the way to go. You can control the vehicles from some type of satellite, some kind of sky network. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you want to get rid of somebody if you're causing trouble? What's to stop them from steering you off a cliff or into oncoming traffic? Oh, this guy's this guy's uh, causing trouble. He's a troublemaker, and he's driving right now. Well, poof, into oncoming traffic you go. Oh, off the embankment you go. Oops, it was an accident. It was driver error. If <laughs> if. If C R is Republican, D is Democrat, L is Libertarian. Okay. Way more crashes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. With the uh, use their name against them. Way more, way more crashes. Godzilla here sounds good to you. Yeah, me too. All right, what else we got here? W is Wupstotska party. I want I want to see more W's. All right, here we go. Flying taxis. You guys ready for this? Right, we have a hard enough time driving on the roads, let alone driving in the air. Here we go. Montreal. From his suite on the 23rd floor of the Fairmont, Dubai, Fethi Chebel surveys the luxury cars and driverless metro line unfurling to the horizon. I can see the future, says the Quebec-based CEO and founder of V-Ports, which designs terminals for flying taxis. Chabel is referring with a wink to Dubai's Museum of the Future, but he might just as well be describing the mode of transport he envisions high above the roads and rails of the desert city and beyond, flying cars. 
Air taxis, long hype, does the next giant leap in short-haul passenger transport are coming closer to a vertiport near you. Even as skepticism deepens over their ability to change commuter behavior and emissions output and overcome questions for safety both real and perceived. Electric air taxis can start plying the skies by 2028, according to a regulatory timeline laid out by the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration this month. Some manufacturers have 2025 as their target, such as Silicon Valley's Archer Aviation and Jobby Aviation. No longer confined to the silver screen in classics as far back as 1927's Metropolis, aerial ferries now take form and flight in more than 700 prototypes and designs for electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. By some 350 companies, according to the Vertical Flight Society, the whirly machines carry the promise of delivering people and goods across congested urban and suburban areas between nearby cities, but with but headwinds around technology, regulation, and investment remain with Canada lagging behind some of its peers on policy, and whether aerial vehicles can move beyond a sleek slice of the ultra-rich and medical and cargo niches in the near term seems increasingly questionable. Okay, what did we learn from that freaking submarine? That went uh, went to the Titanic. Rich people, uh, untested technology. Can you see what's going to happen here? This is, you know, the weather is not always blue sky with no wind, you know, and the sun shining. It gets terrible up here. Do you think people are going to go out in a snowstorm? Are they going to go out in a thunderstorm? Uh, you know, these things are not going to be practical if you want to make it a, a trip no matter what. At least in a car, you can drive in the rain. You don't have to worry about falling to the ground if something happens. These pe these, I don't know if they're going to be... Uh, another thing they could have is autonomous flying vehicles. But how that how is that going to do well in turbulent weather? I just don't see a good... Uh, this is not going to be a good end to this. Uh, hmm. Need to put W next to our names. Technology has stagnated or even gone backwards in the last 10 to 15 years. What's really better? I know that's a good question, Godzilla. What really is better? Like, I don't understand some of these things they're doing. For the state, we all live in a yellow sum. <laughs> You love the idea to deliver Amazon and such via drones until the rednecks start taking pot shots. We're going to take this air taxi and see the sight of the hidden. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I don't know. You know what? It's going to happen. I'm calling it now. It's going to happen. You know, cool, rich guy grabs a bunch of people that want to fly to whatever. Let's just say they're going to go from, I don't know, New York to London or something like that. Yeah, we're going to fly New York, London. Crash. Oh, billionaires die. Ah, this thing keeps going on here. Most VTOLs resemble an oversized drone sporting a halo of small rotors around a passenger pod. Some sporting wings and taking off and touching down like a helicopter, drawing on lithium-ion batteries. They're cleaner, quieter, and eventually cheaper to fly. And maintain the jet fuel powered chopper. Yeah, once again, uh, these lithium ion batteries aren't some magical battery. You know, the the materials need to be mined out of the ground uh, by diesel powered construction equipment, mining equipment. You know, these guys get it through their head. You have to get it through their head. You know, these aren't magical batteries. That are just event, you know, cheaper and quieter, and yeah, it's just ridiculous. While a slew of EV tolls have undergone limited testing, only a half dozen or so companies have furnished air taxi models now taking part in advanced regular flight tests. According to Chebel, they typically carry between one and five passengers with a battery life that can reach up to 250 kilometers. Uh, I think that's uh, like 180 miles or something like that. Roughly. Uh, despite a spending dip, the sector's a buzz with orders and investment. In a six month period last year, more than 80 companies placed orders for nearly 8,000 aircraft categorized as advanced air mobility, mainly air taxis, according to aviation data firm Sirium. 
United Airlines and American Airlines are among the biggest would-be customers, ordering hundreds of the hovering haulers. Meanwhile, Stellantis, Toyota, and other car companies keen on electric models are partnering with air taxi makers on manufacturing. Eh, hey, bonsoir, Alex Mill. Comment ça va? How are you, my friend? Uh, or Space Taxi to take the Challenger. Pa Ooh, Challenger. I remember when that happened. Yeah. Yeah, that was crazy. Amelia Earhart needs company. EV tolls are a horrible idea. Yes, they are, Godzillionaire. I'm I'm just ripping this thing apart because I don't think it's a good, a good idea. <laughs> you take those metrics back. <laughs> it's what's written here. All right, just read it as, it's, as it is. Um, money raised for EV toll development amounted to US $2.5 billion in the first half of 2023, up 15% from the first six months of 2022, though far below 2021, when at least five manufacturers went public, according to an analysis from McKinsey and Company. We're now at the beginning of the valley and trough phase, said J.R. Hammond, executive director of the Canadian Advanced Air Mobility Consortium. No manufacturers with the venture capital heft of the sector's top players count Canada as home. The industry here remains nascent, Hammond said, but noted it has attracted U.S. operators looking to tap into the country's aeronautic clusters. Dallas-based Jaunt Air Mobility intends to shift nearly the entire operation to the Montreal area, said Eric Cote, CEO of its Canadian operation. Where is it all leading? Some experts see the first wave of aerial taxis providing a shuttle service between major airports and downtown vertiports that integrate into the mass transportation system, rather than leapfrogging from block to block or hovering from balcony to bar and back, a hub-to-hub -hub travel option akin to a monorail, but smaller scale and more expensive. You hear that? More expensive. To date, no company has been certified to pick up passengers in an air taxi or EV toll. That's partly because of technological hitches. They, those, These revolve around concerns over both reserve battery power and a vortex ring state sci-fi-esque term for a real very real phenomenon that it can occur when rotor-based aircraft get caught in their own turbulence resulting in drastic loss of lift yes oh by the way i would not unless they had like um giant parachutes attached to each one of these things i'm not getting on one it's like the uh, engines fail you better have something to slow our descent uh, otherwise, forget it. I'm not even getting on. Uh, no company is going to agree to purchase an uncertified, unproven aircraft, said Nigel Waterhouse, president of Can-Am Aerospace, a consulting firm. And if they fail in their certification path, then all bets are off for any order that, that is placed. Regulatory progress also remains sluggish. Uh, certification of something that does not exist, that has no historical data, is a challenge, Cote said. Canada lags behind its counterparts in the U.S. and European Union, whose aviation safety agency last year laid out proposed rules governing the operation of air taxis. I don't mind if we lag behind. If Canada lags behind, I'm okay with that. Uh, I don't think we should try to do this because there's way too much uh, danger, I think. Uh, two billion or five dollars twenty three in seventeen seventy six. Yeah, VTOLs are very hard to pilot too. You'd have to have the best of the best, or just cut corners. Do the Simpsons monorail song. <laughs> yeah, monorail, monorail. Yeah, uh, wing vortices are no joke. Will rip a plane apart. Okay, okay, yeah. I don't know. I don't know that stuff, but yeah, that's that's good to know. You need clown stabilizers? <laughs> yeah, throw some on these guys, will ya? You're gonna high enough for a shoot? You'd still be going too fast when you got to the ground. Oh. Canada will proceed at a maple syrup space. <laughs> maple syrup in January. Uh, Transport Canada does not have ready-made standards for EV toll craft, spokesman Hitchman Ayun said in an email. However, it can certify emerging technologies that have outgrown the rulebook via a special condition of airworthiness, he added. Cost remains another hurdle. Cote pegs the retail price of one of uh, Jaunt's air taxis at around $2.4 million, while others estimate the price tag of EV tolls will hover between $2 million and $5 million. 
more than your average Uber car and slightly above most helicopters. Uh, yeah. Also, a lot of airports now have light rail running right to them. Uh, I know the Vancouver airport does, and I believe the Seattle airport does as well. So, I mean, I'm, I feel a lot safer hopping on the uh, rapid transit than uh, going in the air. Uh, the cost of vertiports complete with conveyor belts, charging stations, and hangars marks another obstacle, said Chubble, whose Mirabel, Quebec-based company, aims to begin construction on a Dubai vertiport next year. Yeah, they can go and do stuff in Middle East. Go ahead and do it in Dubai. They got money to piss away. They, you know, they waste money on stupid stuff like this. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, you might look for clout and, and everything like that, but uh, that's all it's going to get you. It's just going to be for the uh, ultra-rich anyway. Uh, regional trips between nearby cities or for medical care or tourist flights will be more feasible financially and regulatory, he said. Uh, nonetheless, on the urban front, Germany's vol Volocopter revealed in June five EV toll routes planned to launch in time for the Paris Olympics in July 2024, mostly centered around a pair of airports and a heliport in the city's most populous arrondissement. But anything close to a common use might cloud the city skies with rotor-bladed carbon fiber jumbo jet flies, rendering the urban air concept of uh, a flight of fancy, at least for now. Eventually, for these things to run like we would imagine, aka Blade Runner, there's going to have to be allocated corridors for these things with separation and nothing below them. Then how are you going to fly through the city? If there's not going to be anything below them. These things are probably going to be loud as hell. I can just see it now, you know. Wreaking noise pollution from these stupid uh, EV tolls. That prospect also raises the question of broader acceptance. A McKinsey survey in 2021 found that 15 20 percent of respondents could imagine f switching to a flying taxi service down the line. The same year, a report uh, from KPMG measuring countries' readiness for air taxis ranked Canada 10th out of 25 in part due to its eager indulgence of the futuristic concept. We expect public awareness and perception will only grow stronger as crewed aircraft testing in certification intent aircraft commences, said analyst Savathi Sint of Raymond James in a research note. People need to see, touch, and feel what it's going to be like, said Cote. I was in Paris a few weeks ago and Volocopter flew a demonstrator aircraft, which is only a two-seater, but still, it flew, and you could see the reaction from the audience, he recalled. They all said, okay, it's coming. Big deal. I'm not, I don't, I don't care for this. They don't, they don't need to do this. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. You'd rather use Air Waddle? Yeah, Air Waddle. It's like, isn't that the national carrier of Upstotska? You fly Air Waddle or else? Paris? <laughs> well, that's it for the news then, guys. Uh, why don't we uh, stop off and have a little bit of palate cleanser. Oh, hey there, everybody. How are you? Well, I don't always play video games, but when I do, uh... I make sure to safely make a safety save in a safe environment. And if you don't know how to make a safety oh. save, well then make sure you check out Pop Culture Mechanics, 9 a.m. Mountain Time, and 10 a.m. Central on Saturday mornings, where you can learn how to make a safety save that you might be so excited, you could dance if you wanna. So, come on and check out Pop Culture Mechanics on Saturday mornings. Going to see you there. Bye. Finally! Yes! Whew! My God! Alright, back again, and welcome to you, Kitty Bear. Brandon's ended, now you can focus on this. Hey, right on. Appreciate you coming by. Can't handle more metrics or France. <laughs> uh, I don't know what your problem is, eh? You don't like the uh, French people? I'm sure they like you very much. They like your money. <laughs> All right. I found this on there. 
Uh, future force, personnel, services. Why is there a shortage of skilled laborers and tradesmen? Uh, I would hope. I was hoping that Veritax uh, would show up here. He told me he, on my last uh, stream that uh, his eldest was looking into the trades. I was hoping he would uh, stop by and have a listen. You guys, make sure you uh, you uh, make sure you give him a hard time. Is what I'm getting at. Just just give Veritax a hard time when you see whenever you, when you see him. Yeah. <laughs> You're a godzilla with the Monty Python. Now go away, or I shall mock thee a second time. You're out then? Your name is in English? It literally is the word French? Your name? Your name in English literally is the word... <laughs> wow, I did not know that. Uh, the article is, starts out, if you're hiring in the trades, you know there's a massive shortage of labor. The question is why? After all, many of these positions offer generous compensation. However, the problem isn't the lack of salary or benefits. It's that fewer people from younger generations are entering the skilled trades to start. At the same time, there's an exodus from the industry due to baby boomers, baby boomers retiring. Yes, that is true. It's why more and more companies are beginning to partner with trade schools, high schools, community colleges, and other job training programs to get more young people into the trades. In the meantime, though, this means competition is fierce when you're looking for someone with specialized skills set in the trades. In fact, it often takes around two months to fill one job in the trades. If you need to hire now for a particular project, this can cause serious delays and headaches. To help you to overcome them, some strategies include... What is the reason for a shortage of skilled trade laborers and tradesmen offering more than competitive pay and benefits? When you go above and beyond what your competition is offering, skilled tradespeople are more likely to accept your offer. Asking for referrals from employees. Create an employee referral program so that your core staff who refers people you hire have a financial incentive to do so. And I, and we have that where I'm at. We have a referral program and we'll get uh, like points that we can spend in our, in our uh, online store. Um, also that is how I got my job is that the, uh, baby boomer, a uh, guy that was the guy that was doing the job for me, he was a baby boomer. He was retiring. He's in his sixties and they are like, well, we need somebody to replace him before he retires. And that's when I came in and I was like, Hey, I can do this. And I applied for the job and was accepted. And now I am. He's retired, and now I am the main uh, maintenance mechanic. Why get my hands dirty when I can do do, do stupid stuff on TikTok? <laughs> this is true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, what else can we do here? Create a, an apprentice or mentoring program. Pair new hires with existing seasoned employees who can train them and pass along their knowledge in the process. Okay, I don't know any company that doesn't do this all automatically anyway. You hire a new person, you're not just going to put them out there and go, okay, here you go. They're always paired off with someone. You need people to watch over, not just for an apprentice or anything like that. Anybody, any new person that comes in, you have to pair them with someone that's been there a while. Until they're comfortable. Uh, using technology where you can manage projects. Automate administrative tasks and use software to make project management easier and more seamless. Yeah. Once again, go ahead and use technology, but you still have to have people to enter the data. I have a maintenance uh, software program that tracks parts and work orders. But I have to do the data entry. I have to enter the parts. I have to enter the work orders. I have to schedule when things happen, like recurring work orders. I make sure I'm the one that inputs what date it has to be done on. Like this is, it's not just some magical thing that works on its own. You have to, you're the one doing the data entry. Unless you're in a, in a company that's big enough that they have their own, um, maintenance coordinators and such and uh 
maintenance planners. I think that's what they call them. Now, maintenance planners are the ones that, that operate the, uh, the software, the maintenance software. Uh, French is your first name in English. Your parents had no sense naming me. Sure, they thought it was great naming me after granddad and great granddad. Still wish they hadn't. <laughs> oh, you got to run, Godzilla? Here? All right, buddy. Thanks for coming out. It's always good to see everyone's favorite kaiju, Godzillionaire. Uh, what else it says here? Valuing and appreciating your existing employees. Make sure you're also investing in retention efforts, keeping your existing employees happy and engaged. That is a big thing now. If, uh, if you're not happy, you're going to start looking and other companies would love to snap you up and uh, have, you, have you on their payroll instead. Especially if they're hurting for, for people in the trades. Uh, if you'd like help filling skilled trades roles at your company, turn to Future Force as one of the top temp agencies in Orlando, Florida. We can connect you with experienced tradesmen you need where you need them, whether in your production warehouse or construction site. Okay, this is a just their advertisement. Okay, well. That was Future Force. I know there must be a shortage in America. There has to be. I think I swear I've seen it. But if you are looking into it, there are so many to choose from. You don't have to get like like totally dirty. You can do light jobs like appliance service technician. Or if you like dealing with cars, you can do like any kind of auto body, like auto body prepper, refinisher, repairer, or just a regular service technician. Agriculture equipment technician. So if you like working on big farm equipment, tractors and combines, threshing machines i'm sure you could uh, and balers like you you could uh clean up out there and you'll be working probably out in the field though unless they because most of the time stuff breaks down it's out in the field or look at this you don't even have to get uh dirty with oil and such you can be a baker or a barber a boiler maker or a bricklayer Uh, what does it say? Baker, classroom instruction, and Red Seal. Okay, Red Seal just means you can move in between provinces. Cabinet maker, that's nice because you usually work inside houses and such, installing cabinets. And you're just working with wood. A carpenter. Thotic protection, that's working with pipelines and making sure they don't degrade. Communication technician, you would I don't think you'd have to get your hands very dirty for that. Concrete finisher, construction craft worker, a cook. Crane and hoisting equipment operator for a boom truck or a mobile crane or a tower crane. All good uh all good jobs. What's your handle on X? I want to send zits, zits and zittens. We can have fun zitting. <laughs> my previous Twitter handle, or, or my my handle on the on the forum previously known as Twitter, was Pop Culture Mech One. Throw it in here too. I usually don't uh, around the chat or anything like that, but. There you go. That's my Twitter. Uh, what else here? Ooh, you can be an electric motor systems technician or an electrician. They don't get that dirty if you don't mind dealing with electricity. Or an elevator constructor. 
I didn't realize they had their own thing, but yeah, elevators. Uh, field heat treatment technician. Yeah, heat treating, that's an art in itself. You got to make sure you don't, uh, you know, you don't quench or too early or you don't want to make everything brittle. You got to make sure that everything's annealed properly so it doesn't shatter on you. It's just, it's quite the, quite the task. You've got to have some pretty good skills for field heat treatment technician. Floor covering installer. You're going to be working inside. So there's another inside job, and you're not going to get that filthy dirty. Gas utility operator, gas fitter class A, gas fitter class B. A glazer, you want to work with glass, cutting to size, maybe installing uh, windows and such. Work as a glazer. Hairstylist. Here's heavy equipment technician. This is my guest that I had on, on Sunday, Lady Silver. A heavy equipment technician. She she's been at it for quite a while. She's really enjoying it. Yeah, off road off road heavy equipment technician, trailer mechanic, truck and transport, industrial crew construction crew supervisor. Okay, you're not even going to get your hands dirty because you're a supervisor. You have to make sure everyone else is doing their job. Industrial mechanic. Quotation, or not quotation, uh, bracket millwright. That's my profession. You do get dirty in that one. So. Some places dirtier than others. When I worked at waste waste um, waste management facility, yeah, dealing with human waste and garbage. Like you, you, I, you get dirty. You have a shower every day. Because that is disgusting. Uh, instrumentation and control. You're not going to get very dirty with that, but uh, that's a that's a fun one. You deal with like uh, four to twenty milliamps and you know stuff like that. Small voltages, nothing too crazy. Insulator. Yeah, you're going to probably be working outside a lot, especially up here in the winter time. Things need insulated. Iron worker. You're going to work on brand new buildings. It looks like. Building them from scratch. Oh, and you can be an iron worker for metal building systems or reinforcing or structural and ornamental. Landscape horticulturalist. There you go. You're going to be working outside a lot. And you will get dirty, but it won't be from uh, grease or anything. It looks like just dirt. Dirt, mud. Oh, you found me, eh? Right on, kitty bear. Good stuff. A lather, interior systems mechanic, a locksmith. Once again, you're not going to get really super dirty being a locksmith. But you have to be bondable and not have a uh, criminal record, I think. Machinist. Machinist is good. Uh, you really, if you're a skilled machinist, you'll never be out of work. And now that everything's gone CNC, you could start to learn programming. So if you can program CNC machines, then that's even better. Because all you have to do is come in, do a program, and uh, they will just get an operator to operate the machine then. You don't even need a machinist to operate the machine. Metal fabricator, yeah, fitter, motorcycle mechanic, natural gas compression technician, oil and gas transportation services, outdoor power equipment technician. Uh, for power equipment, recreational equipment. So you can work on quads and such. The other one uh, you'd be working on like lawnmowers. Uh, probably like weed eaters and stuff like that. Overhead door technician. I don't want to even want to touch that overhead door stuff. Those springs are way too tensioned up for my liking. You never cared about what work you did. The only thing you never want to do ever again is shoveling half-eaten chickens. Game. Doesn't stink as bad as kitty litter. It ruins everything you wear. Sounds like it. I think I'd be wearing the old Tyvek coveralls. Uh, what else here? Painter and decorator. Parts technician. There you go. You don't even have to get that dirty. Uh, if you're just getting parts for people, ordering parts, you can work in a parts room. Plumber. 
plumber's a good one. As soon as, you know, people uh, don't have running water or their toilet backs up, they're going to call you. Power system electrician, power line technician. Yeah, you're working in high voltage. That's not for me. I don't like high voltage. Recreation vehicle service technician. Hey, you work on RVs. That might be your thing. Um, I don't know how much uh, out in the field you'd have to work. It looks like the guys in the picture are like working, building one from scratch in the shop. Uh, refrigeration and air conditioning mechanic. You're going to be busy in the summertime. Hey, everybody likes uh, HVAC is popular. Heating, ventilation, air conditioning. You're going to be working all the time. Residential construction site manager. Hey, you're you're a manager. You're pretty much controlling the construction site, building houses. It says residential, so roofer. Yeah, you're gonna hang out on roof all the time, putting shingles on. Oh, Alex Moore, your dad did HVAC back in the '80s for Sears. There you go. Like I said, HVAC. It's it's. In the summer, you're making people cool with the AC, and in winter, you're trying to get their furnaces running to, to heat them up. I guess depending on which part of the country you're in, but that's what it's like up here. Oh, sheet metal workers. Yeah, those guys, they can do some amazing stuff. If you're a sheet metal worker, you can uh, pretty much, uh, you know, we call them tin bashers. It's because they can make all sorts of stuff. Mostly ducting. Slick line services, all levels, snubbing services. I'm assuming that's for oil well stuff. I don't know too much about oil wells. And welcome, DJ Ronnie G. How's everybody's favorite techie guy? Good to see ya. We're just going through some of the jobs that uh, are out there. Some of the uh, skilled trades and apprenticeships. And showing that people that you're not going to get dirty for some of these like really extremely dirty like uh sprinkler systems installer or steam fitter pipe fitter steel detailer never heard of that one steel detailer what is that all about Steel detailers are specialized technicians who make detailed shop or fabrication drawings that a steel fabricator or welder uses to manufacture girders, beams, columns, stairways, and other steel components of buildings and structures. The detailer interprets the fabrication requirements for structural steel components using engineering drawings, specifications, industry government codes, and directions of engineers and architects. The detailer then makes the shop drawings and related constructions uh, a steel fabricator will use to manufacture the components. Okay. So he's like a go-between between between an engineer and the welder or fitter. Transport refrigeration technician. So specifically those probably those refrigerated trailers and such. You have to throw away everything. The stink won't go away no matter how many times you wash it. Only the bacteria in it even ruined your army boots. Well your boss paid for having everything. There you go. Steam fitters use something like lead to braze pipes. Steam fitters. Steam fitters, pipe fitters, lay out, assemble, fabricate, and maintain and repair piping systems which carry water, steam, chemicals, or fuel used in heating, cooling, lubricating, and other processes. To install a typical piping system in a commercial building or industrial plant, steam fitter pipe, uh, steam fitter pipe fitters study blueprints, drawings, and specifications to determine the type of pipe and tools to use and lay out the sequence of tasks. Sometimes make detailed sketches for pipe and equipment fabrication and installation as required. Measure, cut, thread, groove, bend, assemble, and install metal, plastic, and fiberglass pipes, valves, and fittings. Join pipe sections, related equipment, and secure in position, and use testing equipment to check system for leaks. Okay, that's what they do. Um, and then the, into the W's, you got a water water well driller. 
a water well driller, earth loop technician, a welder, welder wire process. Once again, I don't like uh, having them separated like that. If you're a welder, you should know how to weld with stick and with wire. Don't just have it so that they learn wire. Because some one day you won't have your wire feed machine around and you'll have to use like some 7018 or some 6010. You know, if you're out somewhere and you got to make an emergency weld and if you don't know how to do it or you haven't done it before, you're going to be lost. Years ago, one of your dad's neighbors was a traveling blacksmith slash metal worker. That man did the weirdest jobs. <laughs> I guess people asking for weird things, though, eh? That's the thing. So you can start even while you're in high school. <clears throat> There's something called the RAP program, R-A-P, stands for Registered Apprenticeship Program. If you're ready to learn and practice your favorite trade while you're in high school, the Registered Apprenticeship Program is an ideal program because or become an apprentice and earn credit towards your high school diploma at the same time. It's good because they're getting into it and they're learning it, but it's also bad because they come out and at like 20 years old they're a journeyman and the funny thing is companies expect you to know everything when you're a journeyman so you'll have you'll have the moniker you'll have the uh the title of journeyman but you won't have a lot of experience to back it up and you need that you need those hours of experience Oh, yeah, there we go. Ah, that's it for now, you guys. That's it for that. We'll uh let's uh look at some pictures. We'll just uh stop that. Try this. Bear with me here. I'm just trying to get things sorted out. There we go. Your dad made him or had him make a part of an engine exhaust because the part was no longer made. Yeah. There you go. That's that's now that's awesome when somebody can do that. Something that's obsolete. And you've got a guy that's just like, yeah, I can make that for you. So here is what is known as a drum digester. This thing is quite large. I believe it's about, what, 5 meters in diameter and 50 meters long. So 15 feet in diameter and 150 feet long. That's what it looks like there. There's... A bunch of them. There's like five of them at this facility. Five drum dumb drum digesters. This is all for munis breaking down municipal garbage. Things that get thrown out in your garbage bin, they end up here, where they're broken down and turned into compost. So there was a problem with this one though. Why? And you can see that the hatches are open, and they aren't usually open, as you can see on this one here. So the hatches are open because it needs to have work done to it. And you can see the giant trunnions here supporting this over here. And there's one over here. It's just weird having a person who most of the time makes horseshoes makes some totally not related just to see. 
oh, they're a, an excellent uh, farriers are are very excellent craftsmen when it comes to that. It, uh, like uh, just watching them make stuff, they they do it. They make it look so easy. So here are the gears that drive these d drum digesters. And there's a pen right there for scale. So that's the pen. Those are the size of the gears that drive this thing. And this is how we got into this digester. They built us a scaffolding. We put in some hoarding on the top here to sort of keep you keep the wind off you. And we bump, but would butt it up to the, against the uh, hatchway there, and we'd climb in and carry out our work. And there's the wooden pad they put on the ground for support. Keep it a nice level ground. And there's our stud welder, which we had to use for installing the studs inside. There's the other two drum digesters that are not being worked on. You can see this one has the radioactive symbol on it. That is because they used a small amount of cesium-124 to they shot it through the end, uh, through a cross-section of it, just to see how much material is inside. That's how, they had to, that's how they had to do it. So the whole inside had to be lined. So you re-lined it with these plates. Plates are five inches wide and five feet long. And they're made out of what's called trime, which is a hardened steel material. So that they could be abrasion resistant because there was so much abrasion inside of the material sliding inside, it would just wear everything away. And there's a close up shot of them. That is what they look like. We had pallets and pallets of them. It was just amazing how much they had there. And they were heavy. And there's more of them covered up so that they don't get snowed on. Okay, that, that one. Got you. Scaffolding reminds you of the time you got a carpenter angry at me because you thought I peed on him. <laughs> it's construction and the fun. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So this is a shot of us on the inside. This is what it looked like. As you can see, these are the new plates that are being installed. And above them, because we haven't rotated the drum yet, that's what it looks like. There's empty spots between the ribs. And you have your, uh, these, I don't know if you can see them, but these are uh, anodes, sacrificial metal. That's a better shot right there. Zinc. These are like two foot long zinc anodes. And they would be sacrificed instead of the metal around them. But yes, this is how you do it. You get set up inside. You have yourself a nice platform to work off of. And there we go. That's what it looks like when it was all touching. This is what we had to wear. This is a fellow from the, uh, he was from Michigan. And he came up to, uh, to help us out from head office, I think. This is one of the other guys showing how badly you would get fogged up by wearing goggles. So we had proof because uh, obviously management's not going to believe you. And this is how we would load those, uh, we load everything into it. We had a scissor lift and you just lift her up and pass everything through the hatch, the guy on the other side. This is a good one. If you haven't seen this, this is what happens when it's so cold out. And you have a heater outside. 
So the guy that had to do man watch because they considered it a confined space. Confined space is, you know, yeah, there's a lot of procedures to go through entering a confined space. You have to be, you have to have a man watch. You have to have people that are on rescue in case something happens. And the guy out here on the scaffolding sat in the chair and watched everybody. And he had a heater, but it was so cold, even with that heater cranked on full, you still got ice crystals forming on the outside guard. Like, look at this. That thing is red hot. And these things aren't even melting. You've still got ice crystals. So that's how cold it was out there. Look at that. That's crazy. Yeah, and sometimes things get broken. Uh, this is a crack in a extension cord. Well, once soon as that happens, you chop it off. Damage rece uh, receptacle end cut off. Yeah. There's another shot of what it looks like inside. We had to bring in our own lighting, uh, our own heater. As you can see, it's got a light bit of frosting in there. Uh, frosting or frosted from the uh, the cold air. And this is the picture of the power cables that went through the hatch. And yeah, there's the ice. There's the ice on the inside. There was, uh, it was not pleasant to be in there. We still had to stay dressed up. Even the mirror was uh, having a hard time. And there's the fella. You can see him in the reflection of the mirror. He's watching all of us. And we had to have a extinguisher just to keep, uh, keep it so we didn't have any fires. And I believe this green thing was our heater. Oops. Another shot of that guy. So this was a pretty big event. Doing this. It was a big project. It took a long time. It's a small heater. We had heaters that were like mini jet engines. One of those would heat the whole floor of a high rise. Horrible to work near. It was so hot. Yeah, I wish I would have had that. This fellow's just uh, doing some hard surfacing welding. So every time, anytime we put on the plates, as you can see here, we had nuts go over top of them and we had to torque them down. But then we had to run beads of weld on top of them so that they wouldn't, uh, the abrasion wouldn't rub the nuts off and cause them to fail. That's our uh, whip check. Just so in case this guy has trouble, the fitting breaks, then the whip check will keep it from whipping all around. Here's our platform. Everything's uh, held on nicely. Guys are working. He's torquing down some of the nuts on the uh, on the plates. And this guy here is um, using the stud. A stud gun, a stud welder. And it's pretty neat how it uh, makes contact and it welds the stud to the surface. That guy's showing them how to torque down. Yeah, there's the heater. That's as much, that's as big of a heater as the company would get us. They're like, oh no, yeah, that's good enough for you guys. What's the weirdest thing you ever had fall on your hard hat? Um, propane bottle. Like one that's for your uh, barbecue. So I, I had a, it was on this job actually. Um, this guy here, he's heating up the uh, plates because when you go to weld, you can't have any moisture. 
you got to remove all the moisture. And so he's taking the tiger torch and torching away all the, all the, uh, condensation, all the, uh, water out of it. So yeah, I had a propane tank, 20 pound full, and it was only fell about three feet, but it hit me right in the head. A uh, hard hat didn't save me at all. I got uh, hit in the forehead and uh, I almost got knocked out. But I stayed conscious enough that I could make it to the rescue basket and they took me to the hospital for a CT scan. There they are still going at it. There's, and I got pulled to safety up the ladder. And that's what it looked like there. Oh, some more, uh, more stud welding. Made quite the, uh, quite the arc there. Guys are just working away. For you, it was a plumber while you were working on a fuse box. The guy used the holes in the floor's water pipe as a sliding pole to get down from the 15th floor to the bottom. Jeez, guy must have just been flying. There's our platform set up. There's a close up there. So that's what the. You put the nut, you put the washer, you put the nut on, and then you weld over top of it. Hard surfacing, yeah. There's where I got pulled out of. There's the uh, David Arm crane that would pull the basket out. A little better shot of it right there. Pull you right up out of that place. Everything, so this is showing that everything is secured. Anytime you walked out of the light where the lights were, it was got really dark real fast. You guys are just working along here. As you can see, we had a rubber backing to put on first. So you put the you put the uh put the studs on, then you put rubber backing on there, then you put the plate then you put another rubber washer, then a stainless washer, and then a uh, nut, and then weld it over top of that. That was sort of the process we had to do. Let's see here. Oh, looks like somebody missed the hole there. Yeah, you think it's cool, Ronnie, DJ Ronnie G? Yeah, it wasn't bad. The guy got fired for working unsafe and putting people in danger. You didn't report him. Someone else did that a week later after also getting hit. Oh, there we go. There's one that's not welded. Yeah, there's a lot of welding going on. Lots of welding. I think we had like three suitcase welders going at once. There was just so many of them to do. It's unbelievable. The entire stream is cool. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'll try to show you guys some, uh, show you guys some cool pictures and such. Hey, C, you're back. Kept the stream running though. I appreciate that. That, that really helps me out. Just showing some pictures of the drum digester when we had to reline the interior. This is a big this was a big job. Like you're talking massive amounts of time. Try to find some better pictures here to show you guys. Let 
There's one of the guys, he's uh, doing the stud welding. That's when it goes off. Oh, and torque them to 60 foot pounds. That was the, uh, the standard set. Right, we're up 60 foot pounds. We've got the torque wrench there. And there's the group of guys. What do we got here? Oh, we're showing how much gap is in the rib. That's how much deformation there was. Crazy. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, and we build ourselves some steps so that we could climb up the side of the walls safely. Was uh, That was probably the easiest way for us to get up until we rotated the entire drum. Now you can see that there's a bunch of them on the top now. We've, this has been, the drum has been rotated, the drum digester. And now we're just working on the finishing up some of the ones on the bottom now sides that we couldn't get at before but there is a lot let's see here that's a better shot lots of lighting had to bring in there guy welding we're having lunch. The guy using the tiger torch, take all the moisture out of the steel. We're all working on that side. I've got some uh, I got some good videos too. We got here. Uh, we're all working together. It's a lot easier. Got the torque wrench on there. Measuring out where the studs go. You're only 47, but the first place you worked a job as electrician turning a factory into office space already has been flattened. None of the schools I went to are standing anymore. I feel old now. Oh yeah, well, there's a lot of stuff that changes as we get older. I'm only a couple of years older than you are, Kitty Bear, and I mean, yeah, there's been stuff that you watched, and it's like it's not there anymore. So yeah, I guess the thing is, just enjoy it while you can. So as you can see on these studs here, there's insulators around the uh, around the stud, and that helped sort of center it in the gun as you were attaching it to the side there. Like I say, it did a pretty good job. This is a good one too. This guy, he's heating up the, uh, like I say, taking the moisture out of it so you can weld to it better. But that's, uh, that's cool. It looks purple on the old uh, camera there. And that shot of the stud gun, our man watch, the guy that is making sure we're safe. Doing a little more welding. Installing the rubber underneath so that the plates can go on top. Tell me about it. you got lost in your own house a few weeks back. You completely changed the roads and buildings. Yeah. Oh, we got lost in your own town. Yeah, a few weeks back. It's, it's what they like to do. They like to switch stuff around. What do we got here? Oh, yeah. that's When you heat stuff up too much when you're welding, that's what happens. You start melting nozzles. There's a duty cycle on welders for a reason. So you got to be careful with that. You got to make sure you follow what they, what they uh, tell you.
and this is so you don't uh, arc flash the other guys that are working with you. You put up a, a nice blind here so that nobody gets uh, arc flash because that hurts. Makes your eyes hurt. Feel like there's sand in them. I got some videos here. Hey, you guys like videos? Play that again a little bigger. This drum is rolling. We're rolling it to locate it. It's like watching straight into the sun for an hour. Yeah. This is what it looks like right here. So he's doing hard surfacing. That was with a sh uh, without a shield and this is with one. A little better. We got magnets attached to the bottom of that uh, shield there so it can stick to the wall. So look at all those nuts you got to weld. That's That's a lot. That one. That one. This one. That's not smoke. That's the the uh, cold air meeting the hot air. In uh, where we were doing this. Why am I not seeing pH scenes happening? Help, I'm stuck in the drum. <laughs> yeah, couldn't resist. That's fine. So in order to get rid of the rust, that fella's using a needle scaler. It's got a bunch of little fingers on it. It's a pneumatic-powered uh, tool. And it hits the steel and removes all the rust makes uh, makes it for a nice clean metal surface because you need that when you're going to do stud welding and then once you do that you grab your torch your tiger torch and you get the moisture out we got here oh when you use the stud gun because it's a it's surge of electricity whenever it gets activated see those wires jump it's induced electrical current the electrical current went through it and pushed away from its from each other
There you go. That's what stud welding is all about. Now do that, I don't know, 50,000 times. And you've got yourself a relined drum digester. This is what it looks like from a far away view here. You can see. Remember the blacksmith list? Yes, you saw that uh, man welt metal plates with just a torch and a hammer. No idea how he managed that. Well, if you heat it up enough and bash it together enough, they should fuse together. Just enough heat. And, you know, it would be neat to see. I would like to see that myself. Yeah, there it is. Good shot of the drum digesters. Uh, let's see if I got anything else here. Oh, that has a whole bunch. Okay. A bunch of doubles. All right. Yeah. There you go. So there, you, there you are. Drum digester. How to reline the inside. We just did it as a. Uh, a test to see whether we could get get it to work and it did work for the most part we did have to go back and change the nuts we used uh flat uh flat plates to go over top of them for protection and we hard surfaced over those that was only after they found out that one of the plates the plates were falling off on the inside so they stopped it we had to go back in put some of those plates on over top of the nuts to protect them and I think it worked well after that that's how that went down that was like the most involved project I've been a part of like I say it was a big big deal big deal that the whole the whole company was watching we were under a microscope and they were they were making sure that we didn't have any incidents, any accidents. Everything was done by the book. And yeah, we made it through. We got a com uh, commended afterwards when the job was done. And it was a pretty proud moment. So I was happy about that. Anyway, I think it's about time. Call it uh, call it a night. I just want to thank everybody that stopped by. Part of the door your dad's rv had a rust hole and he just cut out a piece and placed a new piece in it torched and hammered and for a while and became one seamless piece that's beauty i like skill like that when you got somebody that's got skill like that that's respect right there so yeah i would just like to thank everybody that came out to trades talk today People like Angry Canadian, Whoopa Troopa, Jake D, that one guy, Godzillionaire, everyone's favorite kaiju. And of course, Kitty Bear, you got some pretty good stories there. Alex Moore, always a pleasure. And anyone else that was lurking and watching, DJ Ronnie G, obviously. It's nice to hear from you. I appreciate you guys uh, so much. If you could do me a favor, just hit that like button. You know, subscribe if you can. Spread the word. Tell everybody, you know, there's this guy. He's he's an industrial mechanic. He 
He broadcasts on Tuesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And uh, yeah, we all have a good time. I like listening to you guys' stories. I hope you like listening to mine. There's other good channels out there too. Like Pacific 4 and 4. And Blaine's Escape Corner. Who is probably streaming right now as we speak. Uh, Ronin66. DJ Ronnie G. Brandon the Anime Guy. Nerdporeal Lifeform. Angry Canadian. Whoopa Troopa. And Punk Waddle. Um, I've got a Discord. It's called The Shop. Because that's where all the tradesmen hang out. We hang out at the shop. Um, oh, coming up. It's Saturday. Game day. Going to be more Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. I am just getting so far in that game. I got two more Beanstar pieces to get. Hopefully I can level up and get myself really tough. If I can knock out the bosses. Uh, somewhat easily. Then on Sunday, it's Sunday Anime Chat. It's August now, so that new theme of the month is World War II. World War II for the month of August. I hope I can see you guys there and we can watch some World War II themed anime together. And then we come full circle again back to Trades Talk Tuesday, where I hope you'll tune in and see more of uh, some of the projects that I was a part of. Other than that, I had a fun time. I hope you did too. Watching something is awesome. It's like, or like that. It's a real art. Yeah, it is. You've been reading World War II diesel submarine books lately. That's that's pretty specific. Wow. I wonder if they had World War II submarine anime. I don't know. I think... I don't know if Silent Service took place in World War II, but, I'm, but they had a video game for the NES. They might have made an anime out of it called Silent Service. I'd have to look. Bedtime now. Four hours till doorbell goes again. All right, kitty bear. Sleep ball there, buddy. And yeah, DJ Ronnie G. Um, World War II. I hope you guys will be uh, uh, happy about uh, some of the choices I made. You just played that game for the first time? Oh, nice. I used to play the crap out of it because it was so fun. Sinking all the uh, enemy ships. Uh, but yes, oh, and one of the guys at work, an electrical friend of mine, gave me a welding uh, course book that he found in his garage. It's from 1938. So I have an 85-year-old uh, classroom book on how to weld. So that's pretty cool. I like stuff like that. Yeah, especially for the NES, it was a good sim. You bet it was. I had a great time with that thing. All right. Well, it was a fun time, everybody. Hope you had fun as well. Until next time, I hope to see you on Saturday on game day. Because you know me, I work the weekend morning stream shift. So when you wake up in the morning, tune in to me. I'll be here. Until then, I've been Pop, and I am signing off.